Well, good afternoon and welcome to ESG, Everyone's Suffering Guaranteed. I'm Jason Isaac, and I would love to introduce our panelists, Comptroller Controller Glenn Hager is the Texas Chief Financial Officer, the state's treasurer, check writer, tax collector, procurement officer, and revenue estimator. He conducted a broadband development listening tour in the spring, and his Texas broadband plan, released in June, supports his efforts to bridge the digital divide in Texas and highlights his support for infrastructure investment. As the CFO of the world's ninth largest economy, Hager is charged with maintaining the state's fiscal health having served in both the Texas House and Senate, has gained a reputation for customer service, transparency in government, and conservative fiscal management. Hager is a 1993 graduate of Texas A&M University yeah, is. and a graduate of St. Mary's University, where he earned a Master of Arts and his law degree. At the University of Arkansas, he earned his Master's of Law. And to the far right, State Senator Brian Hughes. The Honorable Brian Hughes is serving his third term in the Texas Senate, representing the 19 counties of Senate District Number 1 in Northeast Texas. Senator Hughes serves as Chairman of the State Committee on State, uh, the Senate Committee on State Affairs and the Senate Committee on Jurisprudence as a member of the Finance, Health, and Human Services, Natural Resources and Economic Development, and Nominations Committees. A little busy there in the Senate. Hughes attended Tyler Junior College and the University of Texas at Tyler, receiving his BBA in economics, cum laude. He went on to Baylor University School of Law and then served as law clerk to U.S. District Judge William Steger. Senator Hughes promotes individual opportunity and personal liberty so that everyone can experience the American dream. Sounds a little bit like our mission statement at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. <laughs> And I am Jason Isaac, uh, commonly introduced as Mr. Kerry Isaac, but today I'm at work, so uh, my wife is either sitting in an appropriations hearing right now or on the House floor, but I'm the Honorable Jason Isaac. I served four terms in the Texas House, and we all served in the legislature sure together at one point in time over our, over our careers. Uh, I joined the foundation a little over four years ago as I was finishing up my fourth term in the Texas House to work on our life-powered initiative to raise America's energy IQ. That's the short mission statement. The longer mission statement is to make the connection to access to affordable, reliable energy and human flourishing because they go hand in hand. This economic prosperity and access to affordable, reliable energy goes hand in hand. And what else goes hand in hand with those two things is environmental leadership, something that we experience here day in and day out in the United States. Uh, it was brought to my attention by some people in the extraction industries that banks weren't loaning them money specifically because they were in the oil and gas business. Um, and so someone said, Jason, you've got to fix this. And I began to find some people that I could work with and trust that were essentially smarter than I am. And we put together what I thought was a good draft of a bill, and that bill became law in 2021. And it says, essentially, if you're going to boycott, divest, or sanction fossil fuels, then you're no longer welcome to do business with the state of Texas. We were the first state in the nation to pass such a bill. And since then, four additional states have passed it. But it, it's this really this pushback on ESG, if you will, this environmental, social, and corporate governance uh, that is really everyone's suffering guaranteed. And what I, I say it does to energy is it makes it expensive, scarce, and government controlled. Uh, but it's being weaponized against responsible American energy producers to the benefit of the Chinese, quite honestly, to the benefit of other energy producers. It's doing nothing to reduce demand, but it is shifting production. It's shifting that production, unfortunately, away from the most responsible energy producers on the face of the earth those American energy producers. Yeah. So since the bill has passed in Texas, Comptroller Hager's been challenged with implementing this. And I, I want to I start out and talk a little bit about, because I did this Instagram reel and put it up on Twitter and LinkedIn, and Sid, our comms manager, is really pressing me to get outside of my comfort zone and do these Instagram reels. We're not on TikTok. I'm not getting on TikTok, so don't look for me there. Uh, but we did this one, and it sort of went viral. I was walking from the Capitol, and I, I was talking about the University of Pennsylvania. I'd heard Congressman McCall talk about the University of Pennsylvania taking $30 million in donors, donations from Chinese donors. And then shortly thereafter, the ESG initiative at the Wharton School of Business 
at the University of Pennsylvania comes out with a report saying that costs are going to dramatically increase because of if states implement laws like Texas law, Senate Bill 13, pushing back against ESG. Hmm. So I call it, now I refer to it as the China ESG agenda because I believe that's what it is. Comptroller, tell, would, would you mind sharing a little bit about the implementation at the Comptroller of Public Accounts at your office that yeah. you oversee and if there have been any cost increase that you've experienced? Tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah, be, be more than happy to. And uh, first, I think we ought to recognize Jason that as he was reading through the introduction, oh my gosh, he sounds like some kind of sports announcer with this <laughs> deep voice enunciating every single word. So, man, you got a career take. in sports Ooh, announcing yes, yes. here. I was impressed. I'm like, wow, that guy's got a voice, man. It's like Paul Harvey over here or something. If you ever uh, need but, a hype man, just call me. I'll pump you up. Come on. Chris, take a note of that yeah, in the back go. there on my team. Uh, you know, yeah, thanks. And I, and I appreciate, at least in the tee up, as, as you were mentioning, that Texas was the first. We were the first state. So in other words, as I've told so many people, uh, me and my team were challenged with this really significant task that no one has ever done before. So I couldn't go to the store. I couldn't buy a product off the shelf, plug it in the computer, and oh, here's the list. There was nothing. We had to literally start from ground zero. We, we built the car, we built the airplane, we built the ship. No one had ever done that before. And so it was an enormous amount of work. We went through version after version after version. And, and one of the things that was Im imperative to me is that we had to come up with a process that one was open, was transparent, so people could understand how did you get on the list, how do you get off the list, and make sure that everybody understood what was going on. Now, to your exact question, of the cost, it is really interesting to me because this particular study, if I recall correctly, was published in June of last year. I didn't come out with my <laughs> list until July. So in other words, I don't know how do you do an analysis, and we do analysis in my shop all the time. You know, people ask me, so help me explain, tell, tell me understand uh, your job as controller, what, what is really your job? And I said, well, you know, I have the constitutional duty on A and B and the treasury and we forecast the revenues for the ninth largest economy. We do this, we do that. I said, let me just sum it up to you like this. I have two words that explain almost everything we do at the controller's office. Either one, it's complicated, or either number two, it's complex. And most of what we do is a little bit of both. And so this, this is no different than that. And, and so therefore it was interesting to me in that Someone would come up with an analysis that there's going to be a cost to Texas a month before I even published a list. So in other words, I don't even know how you base this analysis. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it really doesn't even worth the paper that it's printed on. And so first, you have to know who is part of the list and then understand what are the implications of that. And, and you know, people always ask me, Glenn, what, what is your objective? One, my first objective is to, has, to have an intellectually honest conversation. Second is to have connectivity, and I spoke to a group earlier today in, in oil and gas production, and, uh, and, and you've got your glasses on, and I pulled out to mine, I said, one of my favorite interviews of a lady who was talking about how they don't invest in oil and gas, the world doesn't need it. We are moving on. And my favorite part of that, that interview was twofold. One, she had on her glasses as she is looking at the camera giving the interview, and I wanted to scream and say, you know what, your glasses wouldn't stay on your face if it wasn't for petroleum product, and the, t and the camera wouldn't record you if it wasn't for a petroleum product. You know, and so the point being is I try to continue to have this intellectually honest conversation, which is what we have not been having, and continue to make sure that people have a connectivity that if you want to have a mix in energy balance, which I think we do, you don't put all your eggs in one basket as per se, but you have to make sure you understand. And I think really what frustrates me more than anything else, and then I'll get off my soapbox, I apologize, but I'm on a big one up here and I'm on it because I've been working on this for quite some time. Thanks, <laughs> sorry, Jason. Sorry, sorry. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> um, and thanks, Brian, appreciate that. But you know, the fact is, is that it is really disheartening to me that this whole agenda and push really hasn't been truly transparent, hasn't been open, it hasn't been intellectually honest conversation, and it hadn't shown the connectivity of what we have to have in our everyday lives in order to function. And that, that's kind of dangerous, you know, and it, it really bothers me. And so I'm trying to raise that level of discussion up to make sure that we pull back the veil 
of where we need to be in a true energy policy and a true investment policy, not just for a state, but for everybody. Yeah. Well, you talk about it's not worth the paper it's printed on. The Washington Post reported, I think this is yesterday, the con so yeah, the conservative battle against woke banks is backfiring, which, and, and then in the article, it, it's talking about the guy that did this study at the Wharton School, the right. ESG initiative, says many Texas municipalities began to forge new relationships with their lenders and cost began to decline. Like it just completely <laughs> goes against the headline of their own article. You know, most reporters would just leave that part out because it doesn't go, or doesn't go along with their narrative. Um, and along those lines, in other reports, the, the Dallas News is reporting, I think this morning maybe, mm -hmm. Comptroller, that you're urging the five big pension funds. So I'd, I'd heard something last week that 19 of the 20 largest uh, asset managers in the country are public pensions. So you've urged our pensions here in the state to do what? So essentially, if you look at the law, the intent of the legislature is one, identify who is boycotting the oil and gas industry. And, and I've said very clearly, that definition in state statute is not the Webster de definition. In other words, you can have investments in oil and gas, but it's not necessarily what you've done in the past, it's what you're at today and where you're going in the future. And it's not necessarily rhetoric. Rhetoric is not a measurable item that's more subjective, even though it's very clear what people are saying, but, but, it, but it's actions, it's what you do. And so therefore, we came up with our list of entities that are boycotting oil and gas per the statutory definition. We're gonna update that probably uh, here this month and, and, and we're continuing to update it. We have to update it every year. Any we'll, sneak peeks and we, we, uh, out, maybe a they'll, they'll be they'll or? be they'll be an addition. Um, there'll be a new <laughs> addition. Right. And and so not just in Texas it's complex because it's not just overall companies, but it's also mutual funds, ETFs. One of the things we've had a little bit of criticism say, oh well this is a money market. A money market is literally just cash that doesn't invest. But the problem is the prospectus, if this was it, and it's not really, I'm just using it for show and tell, is that here at the top it says we boycott oil and gas. Well, even though in practice this can't really invest in oil and gas because it's a money market, the fact is if that's what you publish, I'm going to take you at your word. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, there's been some debate, do we leave them on, do we not? And I've said, you know, we need to leave them on because if that's what you're going to have. It. So it, it's propaganda is what it is. I mean, that's really what it is. And so... In, in, in trying to come up with this process to have a list, and now with a letter that I sent to several financial institutions, one of the questions is investing. So investing, and, and some have said, oh, we're not investing anymore. However, we may have a strategic partnership, whereby what that means is I don't invest in Brian's Hughes company, but I go and give Brian Hughes money so we can invest together, and when it's billions of dollars of pensioners money or for the for the school fund, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the points that, look, I grew up on a family farm. We got sued when I was 16. Part of that frustrated me. We didn't, we didn't settle. My family wouldn't settle. It was frivolous. So I figured, you know what? I'm gonna go to law school. And part of the reason my grandfather used to make his deals with a handshake, his word was his bond. Well, I realized not everybody does that. Yeah. So the lawyers get paid to be cued on, on, on wording, all right? That's what, you know, Brian learned in law school, I learned in law school. And my frustration is, while the law may not specifically apply in that situation, I think it's kind of being cute with the verbiage mm -hmm. because the intention was clear. And so that's why I felt like I needed to call attention to this issue. Um, I needed to call attention, and, and we were trying to draft letters. Um, I, one of them had come to my attention. I said, well, why don't we do research on everybody and make sure that we're covering everybody on this issue? So I just think it's imperative. And I think that, you know, people ask me, what are you trying to accomplish? And one, again, it's that on, honest, intellectually conversation, that, community, that, that connectivity, but also trying to change the dialogue and hopefully open people's eyes. You know, Ironically, the lady that's advocating for it not investing, who's wearing the glasses, finally realized, oh my gosh, I'm wearing a petroleum <laughs> product on my face. You know, and, yeah. and these are really important parts of our lives. And yeah. so I just think that is important. And, and Texas can have a sway in changing the conversation. You know, I'm not saying we take credit for it, but Vanguard recently made some comments. You know, uh, J.P. Morgan has last year with the Biden administration pushing back. You know, we, we have to continue to invest. So I think that we are having a change in the conversation, and I think that's important. And I think Texas is the one that initiated 
that conversation, really force that conversation to happen, which I think just is an incredible showing of our legislature last session to pass that and, and force that to happen. Senator Hughes, Brad Johnson's reporting this morning, at, he's at the Texan, uh, that Sierra Club and two ESG-focused asset managers have filed shareholder proposals to end fossil fuel financing at nine banks. Now, this is very similar to what happened last year when you had a summer state affairs hearing, I believe it was in May or June, and we found out that either ERS or TRS had supported some of these resolutions, and they had even supported other resolutions that are contradictory to other legislation that you've worked on, namely the heartbeat bill. That's right. Do you, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, some of those issues that you've had with resolutions and any work that may happen this legislative session or some things that you're working on to, again, to, to continue to push back? In many ways, those shareholder resolutions are at the heart of the ESG fight, right? Because what's happening? These firms are taking your money that's in your 401k or your uh, index fund or your pension money that belongs to you or your university endowment fund. They've been entrusted with this money. If we're talking about BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they control about $2 trillion in assets. And it's not their money, it's your money. And under federal law, right, you invest in this ETF you invest in this fund. Federal law says you have an ownership interest in the fund, but when they take that money and buy shares of stock in Exxon, Walmart, IBM, they own the shares. So they get to vote the shares. And as a result, they have huge interest in all of these major corporations. And so when it's time for the annual meeting, BlackRock, for example, can come to the CEO and say, you know, we have millions of shares of your stock and we're gonna vote these shares at the annual meeting. Would you like to keep your job? Do you like being CEO? Do you like these folks on your board? Do you like this management? Because if you want us to vote our shares in your support, you have to do this, this, and this. It's kind of like in Chicago, right? We've read about this and seen it in movies. In the early 1900s and the 1920s in Chicago, you got a little store and this guy in a, in a big pinstripe suit comes in and he says, hey, you got a nice store here. I'd hate for it to burn down. <laughs> I can help you with that. If you'll just pay me for protection, I can take care of that for you. They are extorting and they're using your money against you. So they're pushing a narrow political agenda, stuff they could never get through the legislature, even, even Congress they couldn't get through. So they're driving policy in corporate boardrooms and it's out of the eyes of the public. And so yes, these shareholder resolutions are a big part of this. And so what are they doing? We believe Texas is being targeted in particular. We know this. The left doesn't like Texas. Texas is the success story that they cannot admit exists, right? Why do these people from other states keep coming to Texas? There's a reason. Texas continues to be the land of opportunity for business, for people, for everyone to have an opportunity to do better and to lift people up in the process. We also vote in a way that's different from these left-wingers. They realize Texas is the key to a Republican in the White House big numbers in Congress, and so they're after us. So of course they're going after oil and gas. And so you have BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, chief among them that own these own shares bought with your money. And then these proxy advising firms. I didn't know what a proxy advising firm was. Y'all probably knew, but let's say your teacher retirement system of Texas or employer retirement system of Texas, you own millions of shares, right? You invest money on behalf of the retirees and each of these shares is gonna be voted at an annual meeting. And there's no way that Teacher Retirement System, uh, the company that, a firm that big, can research every single vote themselves, right? They're gonna vote on all kinds of resolutions brought by shareholders. They're gonna to have to cast these votes. So, as a result, we have firms that have started, it's a free market response, firms have started and they've said, hey, if you're a big fund, you own a bunch of shares, we'll do the research for you. We'll go to the SEC and research every company and we'll advise you on how you should vote your shares at the annual meeting. And it used to be these firms uh, did things based on good corporate citizenship, good hygiene, right? Is this company meeting in the open? Are they following the law? Are they transparent? If so, these proxy advising firms would recommend to teach your retirement system to all these funds, we recommend you vote your shares with management. And that worked pretty well. But now, in the last few years, these proxy advising firms have been taken over by these narrow, woke interests. And that's why, as you said, Representative, uh, and my goodness, just last year, 
shares belonging to the Employee Retirement System of Texas, all right? So ERS owns shares in these banks. A stockholder resolution came at the annual meeting that said, we oppose any new oil and gas exploration. How do you think Texas ought to vote it? For oil and gas exploration, against oil and gas exploration. I think Mr. Angelo knows the answer. I think you know. We know the answer to that. Would you believe that those shares belonging to the Employee Retirement System of Texas voted in favor of this resolution that said no more oil and gas exploration? Yeah, that happened. They were advised by this proxy advising firm. So we had them in front of the committee, and they said, hey, that slipped through. We're going to fix that. A week later, the teacher retirement system of Texas had some shares up for a vote. And there was a stockholder resolution for Lowe's Corporation. Again, we're at the annual meeting. Everybody with a share gets to vote, and there's these resolutions. And this resolution said, uh, we oppose the Texas heartbeat law. We're concerned about what that's going to do. Would you believe that those shares belonging to Texans voted in favor of this resolution that says, we oppose the Texas heartbeat law? That's what's been happening while Texans were busy making a living and providing for their families and serving the Lord and the community. This is what's been happening in these boardrooms. And Texas was the first. Yes. <laughs> Texas was the first to shine a light on this. So that's what we're doing. And so uh, we had a hearing in Marshall. Uh, I don't know if we want to talk about that now or I don't yep. want to take too much time. But so Texas Senate committees have subpoena power. We don't use it very often, but there's power to issue subpoenas. And uh, when we do that, folks have to comply. If they don't comply, they can be held in contempt and be fined for that. And so we wanted to find out what was going on at BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, and also a firm called ISS, or this big proxy advising firms. They're the ones who voted those TRS shares wrong and those ERS shares wrong. So we, had, we sent them a request for production, and they initially complied, Then we had to go ahead and subpoena some of them. Now, we had the hearing in Marshall. Forgive me for being too detailed, but there's a reason we went to Marshall. We love having hearings at the Capitol. It's such a, it's a beautiful building. It's, it's, a, it's a gift from God. It does happen to be located in Travis County. And so if we issue subpoenas at the Capitol and the people we issue the subpoenas ignore them, we have to get those subpoenas enforced. The law says we go to the district attorney who goes to the grand jury. What do you think the Travis County District Attorney would think about what we're doing with BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard? We haven't talked to them about it, but we didn't think we'd get a very cool reception. We thought we would get a very cool reception there. And so we realized to have this hearing and to be able to subpoena these companies and have any teeth, we had to get out of Austin. And so the committee has, uh, has a right to hear and have a hearing anywhere in the state, and our subpoena has statewide jurisdiction. So we had the hearing in Marshall, beautiful East Texas, we had it in December. All the Christmas lights were up. It was a great time. We wanted to bring these New York, these Wall Street guys to America and, uh, and see what it's like. And so, and uh, yeah, and it worked out well. We had a nice time. They all came. The threat of subpoena has, tends to have an effect on people. They show up when you do that. And they, uh, we, we've been through thousands of documents, which I can bore you with later. But uh, we are, Texas is taking the lead on this, peeling back what's been finding out, what, peeling back what has been happening and finding out. How many of us have noticed over the last several years, we've had major corporations getting involved in politics. Uh, back in 2021, we had an election reform bill in Texas. Easy to vote, hard to cheat. Common sense reforms. When you take a poll on these reforms, the majority of Texans support them. But we had companies like American Airlines saying, we oppose Senate Bill 1. You may remember this. Uh, the CEO was pressed about this, and he said, well, I haven't read the bill, but somebody told him he was supposed to be against it. We thought, why are they getting involved in politics and alienating half the country? Uh, in, in Georgia, Georgia was passing an election reform bill, and Major League Baseball was threatening to boycott them. By the way, when these companies threatened us, said they didn't like Senate Bill 1, our response to them was, if you don't like it here, Look at California, they've got plenty of vacancies. If you want to get, if you like the policies better there. Uh, in Texas, we believe in opportunity and free markets for everybody. So we finally learned what's been happening. Companies like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, and these activist investors, they've been buying shares in these companies and pushing them, squeezing them to take these left-wing positions. It's wrong, it's wrong. Uh, those decisions should be made in the legislature where the people of Texas and in Washington where the people of America are expressing their will. And so Texas is shining a light. And so for a long time, the left is the only one that's been pushing on these companies. And so you talk to the management of these companies and they'll say, hey, we're getting all this heat from the left 
and I'm having a hard time getting my board not to go along. So now, state of Texas, Comptroller Hager, Texas is pushing back, other red states are pushing back, and so now, we hope, as we continue to do this and peel back the layers, we hope the companies will decide, why don't we just stay out of politics and let's just try to maximize returns for our clients and let's let the people do the politics on their own. So that's what we're pushing for. We're making some real progress. I want to talk a little bit about the strength of the Texas market because I was reading, maybe it was last year, controller, that you put Unilever mm -hmm. on the anti-BDS list right. regarding Israel. You, you want to talk a little bit about the strength of the market and what happened with that particular instance? Yeah, absolutely. And that wasn't really a whole lot different than when there was a discussion with Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb was a little bit before that, so it was very much uh, similar in the same process of, of boycotting so-called disputed territories in Israel. Mm -hmm. And by not either Airbnb renting in those areas and or Unilever then through their subsidiary Ben & Jerry's, not selling products, that that's boycotting the nation of Israel, which my office has the list of entities that are boycotting Israel, those entities that are pro-Iran, pro-Sudan, now thanks to Jason and others, <laughs> uh, boycotting oil and gas. So we, we you know, have a history of working on these. And so in that situation was very similar with Airbnb, where we put them on notice that going through the due process, we're gonna go through our process. We have a process to go through, but with that, it seems pretty evident you're going to be on this list. And by going through that, Airbnb backed off, Unilever, interestingly, they continue to have fights with their own subsidiary, yeah. Ben & Jerry's. Uh, ben & Jerry says, no, we want to, and Unilever's like, no, you're not going to. And so it's interesting how, that I think, a thoughtful, methodical, transparent, open process that people can understand kind of insulates you from the political criticism. This is just at a whim. No, here is the reason we're doing this and showing it very clear and transparently. And I think that's important. You know, it's, it's one thing to kind of talk legislatively. I've been over there, but as an agency head, it is very important that we have very clear defined ways we do about this because that insulates the state of Texas from undue criticism. And the same thing going back to the very first question. This inordinate cost that the world is going to come to an end in Texas and all of these problems. And I don't know about you, but every morning I wake up, I think about how there's another 1,000 to 1,200 people that call Texas home every day. Half of those are moving here. And people keep always asking me, so why do they move here? <laughs> kind of simple. They move here for the same reason my family did in the 1840s. You know why? For an economic opportunity for themselves and an economic opportunity for future generations. That's why people come here. And I, I, I love, I had read about Unilever, and Unilever is a massive oh, manufacturing enormous. company. And to be on the Texas boycott list would, would, be pretty, would hit their business pretty hard. They actually sold that division of Ben and Jerry's right. in Israel, and now Ben and Jerry, the two socialist communist guys that started that company, <laughs> are suing Unilever to, to, because they're saying they're violating the terms of their contract. But that just shows the power of the Texas market. Do you think it's having an impact on the financial markets? I mean, we've talked a little bit about some of these companies that are switching their behavior. Yeah, I'll, I'll say real quick, if you don't mind, uh, Senator. You know, I, I think it is because people constantly have been asking me, what is your end goal, Glenn Hager, now that you are steering the ship on this issue, that you're kind of engineering the direction? And, and to me, it's not about being punitive. It's not trying to punish. It's about having that intellectually honest conversation. It's about showing the connectivity. And I think we are making a difference with the policies in other states as I talk to my peers in other states that are ultimately gonna implement that policy. Glenn, how have y'all gone about it? And, and I think that not only that broader coalition, but especially companies are starting to kind of back off of some of this strong rhetoric. And, and that strong rhetoric, I, it really frustrates me. It frustrates me that you have elected officials in either other states or other nations that are literally con trying to convince the public that they are going to this non-fossil fuel world, that it is not going to exist, that we don't need it. And, and what I don't completely know, is it that they're being intellectually dishonest? Or are they just not telling the truth? You know, when I use the example, 
Which yes. I know that's shocking about politicians, yeah. okay? Yeah. That's why I always laugh, you know, when I see all the board here, it says honorable, 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 and somebody called me honorable early, and I was like, who the hell calls a politician honorable, really? <laughs> that's an oxymoron I've ever heard one. How about just Glenn will be good with me? Um, but anyway, coming back to this issue, you know, take for example with the Russian invasion of Ukraine how that changed energy policy around the world. It drove up natural gas prices. And the fact is, if you look at countries, thankfully for Europe, they didn't have a bad winter. Because in Germany, for example, which is where my family originally came from, which is an economic powerhouse of not only Europe, but the world, but you know, over the course of their so-called transition, that transition is really just becoming dependent on Russian gas. Yet their constituents think they're becoming renewable. Either that's intellectually dishonest or it's not telling the truth. And either one is pretty dangerous. Yeah, they're, they're both bad for Germany and the United right. Kingdom. They're deindustrializing, right. which is, right. is to the detriment of the people that live there. And that, that's the energy transition. It's and, deindustrialization. And, 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 I'm gonna, and, I, and I want to keynote on that point because I've said this several times. It will be very interesting to see if those countries where they're at from an industrial standpoint in the next 10 years. Yes. So I, I yeah. think that you are seeing that because if, if, if companies can't have that energy that they need to produce the product, at first they leave and guess who loses? It's the constituency, it's the people who are the employees. That's yeah, who's right. going to lose exactly at the right. end. And that's, that's right. the sad part about it. Yeah, it really is. There was, I want to I I pivot back to you, Senator, and talk a little bit about what's going on in East he's Texas. Ready. He's, yeah, ready. he's I, always I know, ready. he's chomping at the bit on this one. I love um, Brian. He's ready. Yeah, if, if you don't mind. But, you know, we look at the top shareholders of some of these companies and, and who they are. And there's American Electric Power Company, top shareholders. I mean, the top two, Vanguard, BlackRock. These are what we, part of the big three that include State Street that are part of this ESG, this weaponization. This, they're part of the, the climate cult, and they're part of the cartel that is really, and, and, and we believe, violating antitrust laws to, to, to hurt these companies. But they've all aligned with the Paris Agreement. I think that's treasonous. I've told members of Congress that you need to call the members of these companies before Congress and ask them, why are they aligning with a treaty that hasn't been ratified by the United States Congress It is not the law of the land? I absolutely believe it's treasonous. And when do the human rights tribunals begin for people like Bill Gates and Larry Fink and Klaus Schwab and Antonio Gutierrez because the policies they pushing, they're pushing are pushing us back into poverty and crushing the least among us more than anyone else. We've got... But, but one of these companies is, you know, they're presenting, AEP is presenting to investors today in Boston and New York that their capital outlays to variable sources of generation, wind and solar, unreliable. They worked really good during the freeze in Texas, exceeding all expectations yeah. at like one and a half percent of generation over the course of that week. Absolutely appalling. 87% of their capital outlays will be there. They are presenting this to their investors today. Are they going in all on all in on government support? Because that's the only way they make money. Our, our Dr. Brent Bennett here, policy director for Life Powered, has done extensive research on this as well as grid policy, which we'll have a panel on Friday about that. But specifically, they're targeting a power plant in East Texas, which I hope when they flew in on their private jets to Marshall, Texas in December, they saw all the steam coming out of it producing affordable, reliable electricity for people in East Texas. That's what it is. To that point, as far as the, uh, as far as the power of the Texas market, you realize this, but we talk about the comments they make. Larry Fink, the head of, of BlackRock, just look up his quotes. I mean, for three or four years, he was pounding, we're going we're gonna, to, about talking about pushing companies, holding companies accountable, making sure they're moving toward net zero. And so what does that mean? One of the real concerns is that firms like BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, which manage $2 trillion in assets, they've all, they have signed pledges when they've joined groups like the Net Zero Asset Managers. Now, what does that mean? Because on the one hand, if you're BlackRock, you can have an ESG fund for the ESG folks. You could have an oil and gas fund for the oil and gas folks. They could just be responding to the market. But what do they do? When they joined Net Zero Asset Managers, they pledged. What I'm about to say is on the Net Zero Asset Managers website. It's also on BlackRock's website. We had to read it to the BlackRock witness on their website at the time. And it says, we joined Net Zero Asset Managers and we pledged to use all assets under management 
to push for carbon zero by 2050. All assets under management, not just the folks who invested in an ESG fund, but all of your money, all that $2 trillion, they pledged to use all of that to push to this completely unrealistic end. And as Jason said so well, the people they are hurting, when they raise the cost of energy and raise the cost of every product, it's the working folks. It's the people on those lower rungs of the economic ladder who can little, ill afford it, least afford it, not to mention all the good paying jobs they kill like they're trying to do. So, so what happened? So after they began to get pushed back from Texas, when we sent notice to them about this hearing we were going to have, we summoned BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. Just a couple of days before the hearing, Vanguard announced, we decided to get out of that net zero asset manager thing. They, they withdrew from net zero asset managers. They're getting pummeled by the left for doing that. Of course, when we did that, when they, when they decided to get out of that net zero asset management group, we said, y'all don't have to come to the hearing in Marshall, but we're still watching, so, <laughs> so be careful. But So we still got documents from them. We let them off from that hearing to show a response to what they're doing. But Larry Fink has toned down his rhetoric. He's backed way off on his rhetoric. But again, when he speaks, when a guy like Larry Fink speaks with as much money as they control, when he says words, even if BlackRock isn't doing anything, when he speaks, it moves markets, it moves money, it has an effect. And that has got to be responded to, and that's why Texas is responding. And so, yes, in East Texas, uh, we have a, a power plant very in the same county where we had this hearing. Now, the, the experts, even the even the company tells us this plant has over 20 years of life left. It's a cash cow. It's clean. It stayed operating during storm URI and providing power. But its parent company, AEP, is the picture of woke capitalism. They're an Ohio-based company, and uh, they're very clear about what they want to do. So they've said they're going to close this plant, even though it's got 20-plus years of life left. They can't give us a reason why. And I know we're, we're free market people, but let's be clear. This is a regulated industry, right? This power company has been given a monopoly by the state of Texas. And in return, the state of Texas gets to regulate them. So it's appropriate for the people of Texas acting through the legislature to hold them accountable. So they're going to close this plant, killing jobs at the plant and at the mine. And so they can't give us a straight answer as to why. But then, but then, Jason talked about their major stockholders. So when you join net zero asset managers, if you're a big player like BlackRock or State Street, they tell you, okay, BlackRock, we want you to go and look out for these energy companies. You keep them in line. State Street, you're in charge of these companies. So AEP, this company that wants to close down this plant, you know who's in charge of them at net zero asset managers? It's BlackRock. They're on BlackRock's target list. And we found a document in BlackRock's files, and it says this. It's talking about coal-fired power plants. And no one's building new coal plants, but the existing plants with decades of life left make sense. We found this document in BlackRock's files, and it says about these coal-fired plants, it said it is, it is better for you to manage down the asset rather than transfer it to a firm that may not be as climate conscious. What does that mean? It means shut the plant down rather than sell it to someone who's going to keep it operating and keep the power going and keep the jobs going. Now, when you read manage down, does that sound like close down to you? Would you believe the BlackRock witness said, oh, manage down doesn't mean close it. Now, she couldn't say what it meant. She actually <laughs> said it didn't mean close the plant. Anyway, we figured out what they're up to, and Texas is shining a light on what they're doing. And the comptroller is correct. We need to make some noise, we need to push back in a responsible way. But they've got to be held accountable because they have a fiduciary duty to their clients to maximize shareholder return. And if they're playing politics with your money and it's costing you money, they are liable for that. So you'll see legislation this session in Texas that makes it clear. If you're managing money for the people of Texas, whether it's a pension fund or a university endowment fund, we'll probably be addressing municipal funds as well. If you're managing that money, you owe to the people of Texas maximizing shareholder returns. Don't play politics with their money. If you do, we're going to hold you accountable. You know, it, it's interesting. When BlackRock came and met with us at our office a year ago, almost nine, ten months after the bill had been passed and signed by the governor, they came and met with us, and, and I said, you guys are a year late. I really thought you were going to lead the economic revolution in this turnaround because of all the jet fuel you were going to be using to fly down from Wall Street to testify against the bill. And they're like, well, we, 
we didn't even know about the bill. We didn't have a state lobby team at the time. And you know, I joked when I was a politician, because we do about all the jobs we create. You know, politicians don't create jobs. Get out of the way and let businesses create them. But I can honestly say I've created jobs now because there's a bunch of BlackRock lobbyists under contract, not only in Texas, but around the country. And their, their lobby expenditures have just gone up significantly, again, using other people's money mind you, to push their narrative. But we started to talk a little bit about this, this decarbonization, like, oh, we don't want to get into the science. And I'm like, but you're part of the Climate Action 100 plus. You have signed on. You've, you've basically bent the knee to the climate cult, saying that you agree with the science and that you're going to drive everyone else to agree with your position. They didn't want to talk about that, but I, I, I did. I let them in, in anyways. It's like every single signatory of the Paris Accord, even China and the U.S., met the terms of the Paris Accord by 2050. The temperature differential by 2100 would be 0.17 degrees less. So we'd stop 0.17 degrees of warming according to the models that the UN Interpanel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uses to justify this push. And I'm like, so okay, let's just admit that does nothing to mitigate a changing climate but it does everything to increase the cost of energy and expensive energy hurts the poor. And I'm like, do you guys have a human flourishing fund? Are you investing in infrastructure in Africa to get people access to affordable, reliable energy from fossil fuels? And they just looked at me like, what's he talking about? But it, it, it's, it, when I wrote the bill, there was a reason I, the first draft that I wrote said fossil fuels specifically. And I, I gave it to a couple people to look at and they kept coming back and saying, we want this to be oil and gas. And I kind of put my foot down and I still hope I have a job in a couple days, because I said, well, we have to leave it fossil fuels. And they're like, why? And I said, well, because it's defined in statute. And I got some weird looks, and they're like, OK. Well, I didn't tell them that oil and gas was also defined in statute, because it didn't help my point. But when you look at the divestment position of companies like BlackRock and Chase Bank, they are divesting of coal. And I've said this in front of two testimonies that I've had in front of the US Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Of all the technology the Chinese steal from us, It'd be nice if they would utilize our pollution control technology, but they don't. And we produce energy, whether it's from hydrocarbons or nuclear, more responsibly in this country than anywhere else on the face of the earth. And you see these companies. And another thing I asked BlackRock, which was interesting, I said, so you guys joined engine number one, replaced three board members of Exxon with activist board members that wanted to decarbonize a business that produces hydrocarbons. I'm like, that's like defooding a restaurant. That, that doesn't work out too well for the owners, the investors, the customers, the employees, anyone. And I said, but, and, and so then they aligned with the Paris Accord. They signed a pledge to be net zero by 2050. It's impossible. It'll never happen. And I said, and so then they sold assets in the Southeast, in Southeast Asia. They sold assets where they were going to produce oil and gas. Like, wouldn't we want an American, Texas-based company producing oil and gas in Southeast Asia? But that was how they decarbonized their portfolio. And they sold it to PetroChina. Mm -hmm. Guess who owns 7.2% of PetroChina? BlackRock. BlackRock's not decarbonizing their portfolio. They're just shifting it away from American energy producers, which I think is anti-American. So sorry, I digress there a little bit because I, I do. I love talking about the science and, and decarbonization. And uh, the, my, one of my favorite quotes is was on this New York Times piece that came out December fourth, I think, last year. And it's uh, Jason Isaac, director of Life Powered Initiative at Texas Public Policy Foundation, tweeted on Thanksgiving, "Today, I'm thankful to live a high carbon lifestyle, and wish the rest of the world could too, because that's truly where you have human flourishing." Um, and so I, I get a little frustrated when I see these people that are pushing these policies and bending their knee to the climate cult to adopt decarbonization because we really want to live a high carbon lifestyle. And we want to bring the rest of the world up too because that's where you have economic prosperity and environmental leadership. So we are just right at about two minutes until we can open up for questions. Did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make before we hand the microphone around? And who's got microphones? Sid? So Sid's our comms manager, has her arm up. Uh, she'll be walking around with a microphone. Right next to her is Carson Clayton. He's our campaign director, just joined the team last week. Courtney Bagley is our education coordinator. So if you want to know, not only are we doing work here within the asset managers, um, and I already introduced Dr. Brent Bennett, our PhD, our, 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 our scientist, our battery scientist, our energy density guy. Um, but that's our team. We're working as, as young as kindergarten all the way up trying to educate people in this country and raise America's energy IQ. Jason, I'll say this before the questions. 
We talked about stockholders, about messing with companies, of course, banks that refuse to loan to oil and gas. Also, insurance companies being targeted. You, obviously, if you can't get money for your project and you can't get insurance for your project, that shuts it down. So you'll see legislation coming out of the Texas Senate that addresses the banks, the banks, the insurance companies, the investment firms. We're going to make sure that everywhere we see them on attack, we're pushing back. And we're pushing back hard. If they're going to mess with money that belongs to Texas retirees and undermine the very Texas economy, we're going to teach them some manners. Woo. Yeah, they're not going to get away with that. That's great. I mean, that, that access to insurance. I was in Indiana testifying in support of a bill that modeled after Texas policy a few weeks ago. And uh, this gentleman from Halidor Energy stood up and said, I used to get insurance quotes from seven different brokers. And now he gets a quote from one. I'm like, that's not a quote. That's a bill. That's an invoice. That's right. um, if you want to continue your business. And we saw the Hartford Insurance two years ago put a, a, a press release out that they're no longer going to make insurance policies available for companies that are in the oil and gas industry or the forestry business. And, you know, going to Nacogdoches, went to school, Stephen F. Austin, forestry school in Nacogdoches, Texas. And I'm like, forestry, oil and gas? Why don't you just throw farming and ranching in there and be 100% anti-Texas? Right. But I'm glad to hear the Senate's going to push back. That's exciting news. Sid, you've got the microphone. If anybody has any questions, please raise your arm. As she comes to you, if you would, stand up if you're able and introduce yourself and tell us who you are and who you're with, if that's appropriate. And quick thing, I'm going to keep my hand on the mic. So you're just going to lean into the mic and make sure <laughs> yeah. your question ends Sorry. with a question. Uh, you don't get to be a speaker on the panel. You get to ask a question. <laughs> right. Yes, ma'am. Okie doke. Uh, my name is Dave Zinker, and I have a question uh, for you, Senator Hughes. It's something you said a moment ago. You mentioned uh, you're talking about ESG, and then and then consistent with that, you said that uh, the folks were, uh, you know, they they were disinvesting in oil and gas, and concurrently with that, or subsequently to, you talked about the Texas heartbeat bill. So my question is, you know, the the heartbeat bill has nothing to do with economics, but certainly has to do with public policy. So so. I'm not sure why you conflated those two. So that was my question, sir. Oh, it's, a, it's a great point. We were shocked. So, so ESG has been pushing against Texas Energy, but it's also been pushing against conservative policy. So let me be clear. There was a stockholder resolution pushed by these same people, and they said, we want this company to take a position against the Harvey Bill. It was so bizarre. Why would a corporation get involved in that? Because they're getting pushed by the same folks that are pushing us against oil and gas. We brought it up because they're attacking us on on uh, social policies like that as well. It's, it's bizarre. We, why would a company, why would a corporation care about that? Well, they're being squeezed by these people that are buying their stock and voting against them. I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Leslie Fitzpatrick. So my concern is, you know, we passed the CRT bill last session, and here recently there was some undercover video, some teachers, administrators saying that they weren't going to follow the law, that they're going to do it anyway. What's our guarantee that we pass these ESG laws? How, what's the teeth in the bill to make sure that these investors do what Texas retirees want them to do? Good news about this is when we pass one of these bills that has to do with Texas investment, we put the enforcement in, hand, in the hands of the guy sitting to my right the comptroller of public accounts. And so all of that money is open and transparent. We know where the money's going, who's investing where. That's how we can enforce those. That's how we can enforce those laws, as if he didn't have enough work to do yeah. already. <laughs> that's, that's why I look real tired. Um, many, how, I, real tired. How many employees are there at the comptroller of public uh, accounts? We have close to 3,000. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we, we stay real busy. I, I was um, on a Zoom a couple days ago, Governor Stitt from Oklahoma and the treasurer there. They have 50 employees right. by comparison yes. at their treasurer office. In, yeah, in one Oklahoma. of the treasurers in another state called me to talk about these issues, over conflated numbers. Uh, Indiana, six and something billion is going to cost their <laughs> pensioners and all their funds. So he called me to ask. And before we got started, I said, Well, I had a quick question. I said, How many employees you got? He said about 42, and I was waiting for him to ask me mine, and I said, yeah, I'm just going to skip right over that. Um, yeah, yeah, so we do have a lot of things, but to answer Leslie, the same thing is what the senator said. The more light you shine, the brighter you make transparency, the more air you put into the room, you start solving problems. And that's one reason that I wanted to send letters to entities last week to shine some of that bright light, because I think... That's the first step on how you get results. Amen. Well said. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, 
Buddy Sipes, uh, I um, am an oil and gas operator in the Permian Basin. Amen. And I want to know, uh, thank you very much, all three of you, uh, for trying to help us in uh, dealing with some of these problems. Thank you. And you're helping the people of Texas. Thank you. Thank you. We <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Buddy, it's people like you that are lifting the rest of the world out of poverty. That's right. That's right. One barrel at a time. We thank you. God bless you. Hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is David Gano. I'm with the Libra Initiative. I'm a retired U.S. Navy chief. Uh, retired you, last sir. year after 21 years. I've uh, spent tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, 13 years overseas. Uh, the reason I point that out is because I got to. Uh, the reason I point that out is because uh, after spending a lot of time overseas, uh, five years in Europe, five years in Asia, my La Twilight Tour was a force in Houston where I taught preventive medicine and to a lot of young activists, even young service members who complained about fossil fuels. And my argument to them, I talked a lot about uh, the EPA, OSH, and how in general the U.S. and Texas does have a better safety culture and a pollution control culture than the rest of the world from my own experience. Um, but those kind of, the questions still keep coming from really smart young kids. And I was just wondering, you know, from the science perspective, what are some... Uh, top two, what are some other things that I could probably tell them to assure them that, yeah, we do produce energy, but we do do it safely than the rest of the world? I, I, I'll jump I'll in here because we're, we're taking this on in the classroom, and we hired Courtney Bagley, our education coordinator, almost a year ago, and her work is going to be transformational on educating kids today and tomorrow about the positive aspects of access to affordable, reliable energy, how, long, how much longer our lifespans are. But people don't understand, and I, I, I spoke to 200 students at Fort Worth Independent School District a couple of years ago, and I said, how many of you think that our air quality has gotten better in the last 10 years? And not a hand went up, and I said, okay, they're just being shy, so maybe, you know, how many of you think it's gotten worse? And without hesitation, every single hand went up. And then I show them the facts from the EPA, and I, this even happened to a senior staffer in the U.S. Senate right when I started. I said, I'd love to come by and visit with you and talk to you about how we've reduced harmful pollution. At that point in time, it was 73 percent over the last four and a half decades. And he laughed in my face, and he says, that's, that's funny, where'd you get your numbers from? And I thought I was getting punked. This is a Republican staffer for a U.S. senator. And I said, the, this little group called the EPA <laughs> and the World Health Organization, and now we've reduced harmful pollution 78% over the last five decades. Our air quality is so safe and clean here in this country that when we take 50% of the cars off of the road because of a COVID lockdown, our air quality didn't improve. We're at a natural state. We, we did some research. I say we, I'm talking about Brent. Brent did some research on this. And we wound up publishing a paper to show that our air quality is natural state in this country. We're number one when it comes to access to clean and safe drinking water. And along those lines, and Buddy, I'm gonna pitch back to you because I, what, is, what does energy do to people? It liberates That's people. Right. And you right. talk about water today. Women will spend 200 million hours walking to collect water because they don't have access to energy. These policies, are, to me, are driving poverty, and that's why I think that's these right. people that are pushing them should be called for human rights tribunals Amen. because they are keeping people in abject poverty, and it impacts women more than anything else. In addition to those 200 million hours, they're going to spend another hour walking to collect animal dung and biomass to heat that water to make it somewhat potable. A cholera outbreak is happening right now in Malawi. Malawi's at net, net zero. How, that, that's the panacea that we're all supposed to strive towards, right? Not exactly. Uh, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. And, and we stand over the key to producing the energy that will lift the last billion people on the face of the earth out of abject poverty, where they'll truly experience environmental leadership and the economic prosperity that we do. And it's an absolute blessing and, and we should be producing more of it, Amen. not less. Amen. Amen. Good question. So banks and credit unions both get regulated either by the federal or the state, depending where they're chartered. Would it be wise to try and bring some of our money that we invest on other states or other entities that are not based in Texas to bring it back into companies that are based in Texas that are regulated by Texans? You know, one of the results of Senate Bill 13, it's a great question. One of the consequences, and the Comptroller knows a lot more about this than I do, uh, when some of these big woke banks have said, we're not going to do, we're not going to fund oil and gas projects. And as those big woke banks end up on lists for boycotting oil and gas, what's happening? A lot of our local communities for, who want to issue a bond for something the community needs, now rather than going to 
Credit Suisse, I can't remember who's on the list. I know a number of them are on there. Now they're looking at regional banks, at Texas banks. And so it's had the effect of doing exactly what you described. Now that those people who are undermining Texas are not in the running, now Texas banks, local banks, regional banks, and national banks that play fair, they're getting more of that work. It's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be big. It's gonna, be a, it's gonna make a big difference. Do we need a Texas bank? I have enough on my plate. <laughs> I, I've already got the gold depository. Can, can, can we use that to back some investments? <laughs> Hi, my name is Bailey O'Donnell, and I'm a Sumner Scholar from Texas Wesleyan University. Um, as a student, this is something that impacted me, but we all know in 2021, the grid failure, um, and I didn't have power for over a week and a half, which means that my school got bumped back a whole week, which impacted a lot of schedule changes and made it really stressful at the end of the semester. Can you speak on how this ESG policies and procedures that big companies are controlling our power with and how that impacts um, specifically that grid failure in 2021? Yeah, no, a great, great question. You know, Jason was talking about that a little bit earlier and kind of making the point that, you know, Texas, we're a hot state in the summertime and we're going to stress the electrical grid, the capacity system on peak of a certain number of days. And then every so many years, we have a significant polar vortex. You know, I make the point on this issue, we're not North Dakota. We're not. We're a very different state. So we're not going to prepare as like we're North Dakota. But on the other hand, we'd like to have electricity if we have a polar vortex that hits a part or the entire state of Texas, that we actually had capacity we could put onto the system. You know, and, and I think in part of that is also a different issue of educating people. You know, if you dial back usage for a little bit, a certain moment of time, you'll help the system. You don't put stress because of those few peak moments. But you got to have capacity in the system that you literally can flip a switch and is not so weather dependent. Now, I have said, I believe firmly you need to have a diversity in portfolio, whether that's investment, whether that's energy. You don't put all the eggs in one basket, but that also means in Texas, and, and that's the discussion in the legislature, the Public Utility Commission, others right now, trying to make sure we have that capacity in the system for when there's an event, the sky's dark, the wind doesn't blow, where is it going to come from? I mean, it's real simple. And, and, that, and part of that, again, comes back to that phrase I keep saying, an intellectually honest conversation. You know, and as, as, as you were asking the question, about your peers and other troops and and then my mind was racing i was like well how did they get to the tour in europe or in the middle east it wasn't on an airplane that had a solar panel <laughs> and it wasn't on a ship and i damn sure ain't oh excuse me hadn't seen a tank drive around like that you know they're all in they're all driven by fossil fuels now of course a few submarines are in ships or not but you get my point and, and, and so when you're asking the question, I was just sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, that connectivity, how did you get to where you're at? I mean, and, and that's really, that's just astonishing. You know, it really is. And that's why I just keep coming back to that intellectually honest conversation, connectivity, so people understand these lights. You know, my, one of my favorites is uh, there, there, was a, there was a deal where somebody was uh, interviewing a company on one of their new electric vehicles. And they were boasting about how great it was. He knows where I'm going yeah, with this one. Yeah, yeah. Boasting about it. And then somebody said, so where's the power come from? And they said, oh, that's such and such power company. And they said, well, what, what generates the power at the power plant down the street? And the person didn't know the answer. And the next one said, that's a coal plant. <laughs> <laughs> that's what drove the electric yeah, vehicle. Yeah, yeah. And we need to have that connectivity and that honesty. Yeah. So then we do have capacity on the system that can flip a switch and make sure we keep the lights on. And, and Bailey, I'll jump in. It's the ESG pressures that companies like AEP are experiencing from their largest shareholders why they're going to close this asset that's still good for 20 more years, that has hundreds of people employed, that's producing clean, affordable, reliable energy in East Texas. But that's, that's the pressures of why. So we're losing reliable generation. We're not building any new reliable thermal generation but we sure are adding a lot of unreliable variable generation because that's where the market, because it's so distorted, is directing invest, investment. And, and do understand also, if the rhetoric, and that's not what my test is for my list, but if the rhetoric is pushing this entire agenda and policy and everybody kind of follows, if you're on the investment side on the front end of it, guess what? You can make a killing. Because essentially you force policy to follow where you're investing. 
you're on the beginning edge. And I can promise you there's a lot of that going on. Amen. And that's dishonesty. And, but you gave me a good segue for our panel on Friday. Power struggle, how to make the grid more reliable and energy more affordable. And if you want to see a doppelganger, I'm, I thought, gosh, it's been two years. I went to PragerU in California in 2021 and shot a five-minute video called The Great Texas Freeze. And I'm thinking, it's been two years. I can wear the tie again. I'm wearing the exact same thing in that video. Uh, so it's just kind of funny. But yes, that's the PragerU Great Texas Freeze video. It's got well over two million views to date and still keeps trending back up and up as we see grid failures around the world happening. Hi, Vince Puente, Fort Worth, Texas. I want to say howdy to Ice, Jason, howdy to Glenn, howdy to Brian. And I say that because, Glenn, people don't just come here for the economic advantage. They come here for the howdies. We have so many people come through our home that are from out of state, and they just shine when I ask them how they like Texas. And they talk about the friendliness and the God-given culture that we have. So I just wanted to touch on that. But going from there, um, on our wind and solar, I'd like to know if there's any Texas tax dollars that are subsidizing those. I know there are federal. And then I'd like to jump over to nuclear. We've got a great nuclear plant in, in um, Glen Rose, Texas. It works great. It, it runs. It gives us energy, et cetera. And what about us going there? And one other quick comment on coal. I've got several clients that are coal plants. When they shut them down, it takes over seven years to close them down. They have to return the grounds and the things back to the way they were, and it's a huge cost. So shutting down coal plants not cheap. Okay. So, so to, to answer your question on uh, state and whether investing or, say, for example, tax incentives uh, is, is the big one. You know, in the last uh, legislative session, there was not a uh, renewal of what's called the Chapter 313 agreements which in essence is a property tax abatement with school districts as well as with a company. And originally 20 years ago, that was for manufacturing. Uh, my staff, we don't sign the agreements. We do look at them to make sure the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted. We collect the data, the information, both the really good data and the poor data um, that some people still want us to come, come collect. I'm picking on Jason um, and he knows that, um, but anyway, we collect all that, publish it, and we were just uh, discussing with the House Ways and Means last week how uh, last year as that program was closing and it ended on December 31 of last year, the fact is two thirds of all of the agreements that were signed, 67% to be exact, were all renewable. 33% are manufacturing. So the significant vast majority of the agreements that are signed in the last year and the last six months are really for renewable. And so that was the biggest, uh, if you'd want to say, t state of Texas program that enabled more renewable wind and solar, it was that program. Which is why a lot of the discussion during the legislative session right now, and I'm not a member, I don't have a vote, they are the policy makers, we implement in the executive branch, but big discussion is if there was a program of some degree, not that program, but something I do think the biggest discussion point and probably hurdle of getting something passed, in my opinion, is the renewable piece. And yeah, let me follow up. Comper was exactly right. So that chapter 313, you know, the idea is if someone wants to bring a factory to Texas, right now on this land we have nothing. They're paying zero taxes. If you'll come and build your factory, we'll give you a break on your taxes for a certain amount of time because we would take 90% of, of your factory versus 100% of zero. So, that concept makes sense. But yes, Chapter 313, been in place for almost 20 years, it was just swallowed up by wind farms and solar and solar projects. And so that bill was renewed, that program was renewed in the House, came over to the Senate. Senator Lois Colcourst and I voted no in committee, and the bill stopped there, and never made it to the Senate floor. So that program expired. So now there is a discussion. Do we need some kind of an economic development program? Hey, nobody likes corporate welfare. I don't like corporate welfare, it makes sense. When they get, when a company's deciding where they're going to come, they narrow it down to us and one other state, some third world state. It shouldn't be a hard choice, right? We get that. They're going to come to Texas. Louisiana. I'm that's sorry. Wrong, I'm man. sorry. I'm sorry. That's wrong of you. I'm sorry. That the was Cajun unfair. Cajun Nagy came over during Hurricane Harvey and helped all my constituents in some Houston. Of, some of those Louisiana folks vote for me. I, 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 I appreciate that. <laughs> Not really. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, 
I think there, there's a big discussion now, but yeah, are we going to have some kind of a new program for economic development for a new industry? But let me be clear. Let me be clear. I don't know if such a program will, will, will be developed or not. If there is a proposal for a new uh, economic development program to give incentives, if it has wind and solar, I'm, just, I'm not just going to vote no. I'm going to do everything I can to kill it. I can tell you that will not pass. I don't believe that will pass the Texas Senate with wind and solar in it. Time for one more question. Oh, yes, back here. Yeah. yeah, it's a federal problem. We yeah. need nuclear. We have two nuclear plants, so I guess four units, two at yeah, Comanche right. Peak, two down in Bay City outside Houston. My goodness, it's, it's clean. It's almost free once you build the plant. The fuel cost is so small. The feds are the problem. The feds will not let us permit new nuclear facilities. We need them. That's the answer. I think that's a big part of the answer. There is a right. little bit of hope that's to end right. optimistically. Right. They did just approve small modular reactors, which is good. This is actually using the spent fuel rods. It's amazing what we do with waste in this country. In the Northeast, they burn it and make electricity. It makes more electricity than renewables do in the Northeast, which is great. That's good. They're using pollution control technology, and now we're starting to approve small modular reactors. So I do want to have some hope because we should right. see nuclear growing yeah. along with GDP or population or right. some combination of it because it's great baseload. But natural gas and coal are the ones that we really need to be able to flip a switch and turn them up when we need more and turn them back down when we don't. Right. Quick question for Senator Hughes. I'm Don Bennett from Austin, Texas. I so appreciate the work that you do. All Everyone on the dais, but especially what you've done with the hearings with the BlackRock and whatnot. But I'd like to see us pass legislation that required electric vehicles to only be charged with wind or solar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The amount of electricity they use, I mean, you guys probably know this, but when, when, ele when an electric vehicle is charging at a, at a large convenience store, when it's, it's charging, it's using as much power as the whole store. You know what's happening? Subdivisions that were developed uh, in the last over 20, 30 years ago, when too many people have to plug in their electric vehicles, the power company has to come in with more capacity. It's amazing how much power they use, and you're exactly right. <laughs> that's, that's like a great idea. <laughs> I, I, I thought when, when we, yeah, when, yes. when, when well, the California states. and Gavin Newsom banned the sale of internal combustion engines last year, and then you had hurricane hit Florida, and electric vehicles were catching on fire because they had been sitting in salt water and burning homes down, not just their homes, but their neighbors' homes. I thought, oh gosh, the most DeSantis thing he could do right now is ban the sale of electric vehicles in Florida, citing safety concerns, but that idea hasn't resonated too well, but it would be kind of funny. Actually, we've got time for one more question, ma'am. I know there was someone over here that had, a, had their hand up. We'll jump up, and while Sid's walking over, I want to introduce two more people. Jamila Parachi is a new senior fellow with the Life Powered Project. Jamila Wave. It's a and then Mike Nassi is also a senior fellow who's leading the panel, moderating the panel on Friday that I hope you'll join us for. Yes, ma'am, you get the last it's question. It's uh, Rupal Chaudhry, and uh, one of the things that it, most people don't talk about is, uh, you know, when you talk about solar and wind, they're not talking about what is happening when the wind uh, goes out of, uh, I mean, the landfill that happens. Right. Right. And that is one of the conversations that need to be covered because right. fossil fuels may have their place, but again, wind uh, energy is not, again, without the landfill. And there's thousands of, I mean, just the blades are just sitting and there's nothing to be, uh, that's happening. Also with the batteries, lithium, where is it mined out of? And I think that is something that uh, needs more light to be shed on because everybody's promoting electric vehicles, but where's it coming from? And who's becoming more rich? Where, where is it coming from, the environmental issues in those countries? And oh, by the way, what is it being mined with? Something that's powered by diesel, typically. Um, but yeah, the, you know, it is, it is pretty amazing how several states, California, for example, uh, I think it was the LA Times last year, which kind of was shocking to me, one of the big issues is what is California going to do with the solar panels? And part of the discussion was the mercury that was in the panels and where are they going to go? There was not preparation for that. So it is, it is very significant environmental issues there. Again, the connectivity that's not discussed. No, it, it's really not. And it's, it's unfortunately getting shoved under the rug. Siddharth Kara, who's a, a Harvard researcher, just published a book called Cobalt Red. He's still a climate alarmist, but he's bringing a fact to the light of what's happening in these mines in the Congo, where UNICEF reports you have 40,000 children between the ages of four 
and 13 years old working in these cobalt mines. I've social shared some pictures of a young girl, she looks about 13 years old, putting her baby in a cardboard box so she can get back to mining. And it's all artisanal mining, it's hand mining. They're using little hand axes and, and chisels to get to the cobalt that's gonna make the lithium. Uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking that people are working in these conditions and it's being driven by the massive government distortions, the policies that are put in place, the subsidies, and this ESG movement that's directing money into this, this green boondoggle, as I like to call it. So great last question to end. Uh, we, we do have some optimistic notes. Again, as I said here in Texas, we stand over the key to ending poverty and we right. produce it more responsibly than anywhere else on the face of the earth. So we should be producing more energy here in Texas and in this country and exporting it in our clean air and our freedom around the world. I want to remind you to please join us for our next panel moderated by the Honorable Larry Taylor. The panel will be in the Zlotnick Ballroom at 315, followed by our complimentary cocktail reception at 430. Please give it up for our amazing panel, Comptroller Glenn Hager and Senator Brian Hughes. Gentlemen, thank you so much.